By the way, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome all of you uh, to the webinar on impact of temperature on EV powertrain. Uh, the objective of this webinar is, like people say, a newspaper says that okay, hey, this could uh, the temperature could impact a range about thirty percent. Even in the cases, it's about like forty-five percent if it's a worst case conditions, depending upon the age of the, the battery and stuff like that. So yeah, that's that's good news. I mean, a bad news basically. So we're trying to understand that you know how, how is that really is happening inside of the system, right? And uh, if it is really happening thirty percent, and like you know, if your customer is not going to be happy at all because he buys the vehicle on one day and the temperature is like 25, 26, 30, his vehicle gives him seventy first charge, and then he drives it on the other day where the temperature was crouching around forty, forty two. Oh no, it, it's giving around 60 and it's giving around 55. So he is totally not happy with the product, right? And maybe if it goes a little lower than 20, 25, and like let's say 10 or something like that, it it's again impacts the, the, I would say, as a performance and also in terms of the range. So this is very challenging. I mean, you, you can't have a product which just does you know, fluctuate too much around the requirements. But also you can't design a product which doesn't fluctuate because inherently there is energy consumption in, in various different forms to retain the temperature at a specific point, right? So it's a complex, very complex uh, things to study. Uh, at, at industry, people are spending a hell of a lot of time on thermals because it's very critical and, and any product which you sell in the market has uh, huge positioning, right? So it's not just, okay, I'm going to sell this at the state and they're going to customer going to use it only here. It's, it's no way like that, right? So it, it's going to be a challenging and, and the environmental conditions vary at every place and with respect to seasons. So it's quite obvious if you sell a vehicle, it is going to be abused at various different temperature levels. And yeah, so you got to design a product, which is so good that you have understood it to that level. Uh, you know how it's behaving, you know why it could possibly behave like that. At least you have that analytical reasoning to provide that this is how it is and we know the product's limitations, right? And without knowing that, and if product is in the market, it's it's really tough. And just to know these parameters is just not easy because they're very non-linear in nature and and all the components in together. So it's, it's a lot of factors to be considered for the study. So that means it becomes more and more complex. Uh, to understand uh, the behavior, influence of temperatures at various different times and positions of the, of the vehicle operation. So that's, that's the quite interesting topic and uh, that's what brings us uh, here uh, today um, uh, to talk about it. So this is what I have planned for the webinar flow. Um, that's me who will be talking right now, so Suraj. Um, so, and on the other side, which you see in the left, so the topics which I will be covering, uh, real case studies and the temperature impact on cell and, behavior, cell and battery. Um, there's a lot of difference between cell and a battery in terms of temperature. Um, and then temperature impact on motor, track systems, auxiliary loads. I would say I would not be able to cover up something that I know how we in, you know, implement these studies in, in modeling because that itself is like, I would say like one of that topic is like a maybe eight hours or nine hours of our discussions and the modeling with it to study the system behavior. So what I would be touch basing is to emphasize the importance of that specific, you know, component uh, getting influenced by temperature. So that, you know, it, it, it gives you an understanding that, you know, why you actually perform a simulation, right? So or if you perform certain studies and testings uh, to, to understand the system, right? So, that's those are the topics I'll be touch basing. There could be many other topics, but but I, I won't be touch basing them because that's the limitation of time and data. So we are planning it for forty five minutes and plus uh, fifteen minutes of QA. Um, I hope that sticks around, and maybe I would request other plus or minus fifteen minutes depending upon your questions and your advice. Great. So if you see real case studies, I already sort of took this words around uh, a few minutes before that. The temperature is not constant at every place, right? So it, it's it's drastically varying uh, because the normal conditions are getting changed. Uh, seasons are there across the whole year. So yeah, for sure there is a, a variation in temperature. Uh, on summers it's different, winters it's different, rainy season it's different. So 
there is a variation of temperature all across the the seasons and this is one of the things so that you know any any product which you're trying to develop should always fit in in those operating requirements right so that's what this image says that you know you could have a temperature on one one side and then later it could change to totally negative on the other season so it's it's very wide range of operation but none of your components which are in the system may not be designed to operate in those wide bandwidth and that's the thing that you should know what those bandwidths of temperature are so the, the also a deeper meaning of that is like you, you could know a variation of temperature across the last like 30 years in the history and know okay this is my range of operating temperature and maybe a, you add a safety factor because you're expecting a worst case conditions to happen so yeah it could keep in worst case and then yeah you could you could think that okay this would be possibly a largest variation of temperature i could have found in a day and largest variation of temperature found in between seasons are found in across the year so that it gives you a solid idea to where do you want to start understanding that okay hey this is where the temperature is possibly going to be subjected to and that that's what my product should be fit in between for this operation Right, so that's where you should all start and understanding that temperature is a parameter and knowing what temperature is a range is another complex approach itself because you should have all the weatherman data to know what was an average temperature for all your studies in the, the further slides of the discussions. And uh, so if you see here, like what I'm trying to talk is just not over the air. Uh, it's worth the data uh, and also it's a lot of test cases and also it's with the data which at decibels, we have studied for various part range and internally for teaching purposes and also for consulting purposes. So if you if you see here that you know it's in data from Nissan Leaf, an average energy consumption, it's in Fahrenheit. It's about like you could clock that 65, 70, about uh, 25 degrees Celsius. So at 25 degrees Celsius, so the energy consumption uh, at 25 degree atmospheric temperature. Uh, when when the day was that, and you could see the the temp energy consumption was somewhere about like 265, 270, or 285 around um, a watt hour per mile, right? So, but if you see uh, increase in temperature, it it is increasing the energy consumption, and decreasing the temperature is also uh, you know uh, increasing the energy consumption uh, per mile. So, end of the day. If you're consuming more energy per mile, your range is going to be affected as straightforward as that, right? So, so the understanding is that your temperature is really, really affecting the energy. So, um, if you see there, it's about like 275. Let's average it out. Uh, if you see the temperature is about uh, 18 degrees Celsius, sorry, uh, somewhere around 20 Fahrenheit. So it's it's talking about like 450. That's about an average of uh, more than Six, 60 to 70 percent energy consumption in higher, higher numbers it's very of a, very much of a challenge and uh, if if we did not consider these parameters into our studies and if it doesn't go that you know worst case but if you still take about 20 degrees celsius of difference between zero to uh, 25 to five and and 45 degrees celsius you still see an average variation of about uh, uh 40 percent 30% energy, uh, you know, increase in the energy consumption at the part rate. So that's a lot of uh, energy, right? So if you're talking about a vehicle, so you have to look into those details that, you know, what these components are actually, you know, consuming this energy or creating a need uh, for, for the energy consumption from the battery, right? So that way, you know, okay, this is how I would possibly know the packaging size of the battery pack, possibly I would possibly have a little tolerances to adopt for my temperature too. And maybe some of the tolerances for my aggressive driver behavior, some of the tolerances for um, adding to a point as a depletion of uh, battery with respect to aging. Like this, you could always have some tolerances that you add your battery pack to be a little bigger and that you compensate always and your customer still feels that, okay, we can still giving me about average of 70 kilometers range per single charge at least at the 65 so he's quite happy within that so that is where it, it is all starting and that is where you, you see that it, it is really impacting and that's how we see a data that it, it has proven that it is impacting and now let's understand what these things are getting impacted 
I know these slides have been there in, in few of our last presentations and, and definitely there is no change in the scope and the scope is the same. Uh, but we'll try to see uh, going a bit more deeper of, of our chemistry side and trying to understand what is actually happening at a cell uh, when temperature is going uh, lower. Uh, what is happening at a cell when temperature is going uh, higher. So, and, and how is that actually impacting the range of the vehicle or uh, energy consumption? Uh, that's because the battery is going to be one of the more, most important component, uh, not only in terms of its uh, energy consumption uh, for itself, or let's say the way it stores the energy at different temperatures. It's an expensive element and the impact of temperature is not one, it's a memory effect. It could just keep repeating and impacting the battery to go bad and bad and bad again and again. So it's, it's quite evident and important to know and keep the battery within the temperature bandwidth. So what exactly is happening here? Uh, the temperature can be increased uh, or like, you know, increased only because of reactions inside the cell. When you talk about reactions, there are various different, you know, type that could come in how the heat possibly can get generated at the cell right so you could you could i could show you some links where there's extensive studies of why temperature can get raised internally within the cell and those that itself is like maybe 10 phds into a place we had to study why these temperatures are getting increased inside the cell and what are the reasons for this uh rising temperatures uh if you see on the other side like the uh, lower, lower temperature is because of possibly the atmospheric influences. So the cell may not be able to go just down its temperature and then unless the temperature atmosphere influences that. So the temperature rise can possibly because of uh, cell uh, reactions and the temperature going down is because of atmospheric conditions. And also temperature rise can be added uh, along with cell reactions and uh, uh, with the uh, uh, atmospheric temperature influences. Okay, so um, that's going to be uh, two things. One is uh, temperature getting increased inside the cell and temperature getting increased because of atmospheric conditions. And on the other side, temperature is getting reduced because of atmospheric conditions, right? So this is, this is three cases in your place. Why, how temperature can be possibly, you know, uh, coming into the uh, situation for the studies. Just trying to confirm if anybody could just confirm that, you know, if my audio is uh, good for you, is it like coming up twice uh, because I'm having my other phone where I'm trying to just, um, uh, you know, have a reference for your chats. Is it good? Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Okay. So guys, if, if I'm, Kind of boring you so just do let me know uh, i'll try to have that topics concluding right there so because i don't want you to sort of feel bored because it's important that this session is for you uh so yeah coming to the point of cell so what can happen if the cell goes to a lower temperature right what can happen if cell goes to a lower temperature is because the rate of reaction is always proportional to our temperature because it's it's chemistry right things is happening uh, electrochemistry so uh, the temperature can influence the cell reaction rate I mean how fast the reaction can happen right so that's that's the factor what the cell is getting influenced uh, towards so that's one of the parameter and the second parameter is uh, ionic conductivity of electrodes and electrolytes so this comes two important things. One is uh, the rate of reactions and the ionic conductivity of electrodes and electrolytes. So if you take up or lower temperatures, both the ionic conductivity of the electrolyte can go lower because the electrolytes start to become a bit more viscous at uh, lower temperatures. That means it is tough for, for to have a, a, a better ionic conductivity. And that means it, it basically uh, you know, increases the cell's internal resistance and that relatively increases the cell's impedance. Uh, it's, that's what is happening. So that cell has to undergo a lot of pressure to, to give out what you're demanding for. It means it is losing out a lot in, in trying to overcome the situation if it is at lower temperatures. 
And also on the other side, uh, the, the diffusion of lithium ions at the electrode, electrodes, right? So that is also happening uh, very, very, very slow. Uh, so it, it's quite tough uh, if we, there is no right, you know, component, sorry, right packaging, right? Uh, I would say proportions of active materials are there on the uh, on the electrodes. For example, if the temperature, if the energy required for active material is higher, and if the temperature is very low, then you don't have that enough energy for activation material to function. So you don't have proper, uh, I would say, uh, uh, diffusion the reactions happening that the lithium ions can be you know, released or you know get accumulated and intercalated into the uh, uh, electrodes. So that could be a few reasons why this temperature is actually influencing uh, the situations of uh, uh, chemical reactions. On the other side, um, when the temperature, if you take a cell and if you, if you test that cell uh, for capacity retention at 25 degrees Celsius, and if you take a same cell, same cell and try to subject that to uh, storage temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, sorry, let's say minus 20 degrees Celsius. So what is its ability to retain that SOC for a span of time? You charge a cell for 80%, uh, you keep a cell at 25 degrees Celsius and you measure a cell's SOC after a number of days. And then you take a same cell and you keep it in a temperature which is lower than that. And the cell will lose uh, ability to retain that SOC at different temperatures because of you know internal uh, self reactions which is happening on the other side um, if if you start to uh, see on the uh, higher side of the temperature so it could possibly lead to uh, uh, a SEI layer formation or SEI layer degradation and also it will it will cause some of the uh, formation of acids inside the the cell itself and this is going to erode and you know, ask to form the SEI layers. So the, all these things are happening and possibly on the other side, uh, which is uh, uh, causing the lithium plating to happen at, at conditions. So many things are happening inside a cell when, when you're trying to take the cell to a lower temperature or you're trying to take the cell to a higher temperature. And sometimes this is, uh, you know, this can be reversible and sometimes it is irreversible, like loss of active material like lithium in, in formation of lithium plating. Uh, if you lose an active material, so you never be able to recover that active material back into a place and that would be possibly a reversible reaction. And, and on the other side, when, you, when all these things are happening, basically the battery uh, uh, ability to store and you know, provide an output is also degrading very gradually. So that is what's happening at a cell. And uh, if you summarize very simplistically of all these things, okay, can I relate an impedance of the cell with respect to temperature? And can I you know, also relate that impedance of the cell over uh, uh, aging, right? So this is two important parameters. You should study how uh, a cell could be, like I would say, application engineering point of it, right? Because all these things happens at a chemistry side of it. These chemists should study, electrochemists should study all these things and give us data in terms of the impedance, in the behavior of impedance with respect to uh, temperature and uh, also possibly if you make a three axis graph, so possibly behavior of uh, impedance with respect to cycle numbers and with respect to temperature. So if you study all these things and you could possibly do a, a, a a proportionately fitting a graph somewhere and trying to see, okay, how can I, you know, study and add an influence of temperature onto my model uh, in the simulation studies where if you can implement them, so then you have uh, an impacted day's temperature. And if you, if you implement the day's temperature into the model, you will be able to check, okay, uh, on this day's temperature, possibly the battery SOC uh, will be this much uh, for this drive, driving range or an average energy consumption per kilometer is higher uh, because of the temperature variations, right? So you could study those parameters. So at a very application level point of it, so you could have a graph of impedance and maybe also uh, cell aging as a parameter if you're trying to implement all of them together along with temperature. And you could implement that as part of your model to study how possibly the, the, the energy consumption could vary with respect to temperature. And uh, the same way if you go to temperature impact at the motor. So uh, like in, in a simplicity, 
the the efficiency of the motor would depend upon your torque and the rpm and also the temperature so as i said this is also sort of uh, a memory effect in cases because uh, if you subject the uh, the the motor to a higher temperature uh, because they have a permanent magnet they would demagnetize they lose their capability to you know have that uh, have better magnetic fields so that's one point and on the long run and the other side the temperature is actually influencing the efficiency of the motor and if that say if, if there is no if the day is very very hot and there is no uh, uh, forced cooling systems available for the motor and motor goes up above let's say a specific temperature and then it is basically operating in bad efficiencies and working in a bad efficiency means it is going to consume more energy let's say if the motor is operating an optimal operation at its conditions was let's say 90 percent efficiency right and if that uh, if that becomes something like uh, a 10 percent lower so it means it's at 80 percent now uh, because of the temperature influences and it means it's supposed to consume let's say 100 amps of current possibly it's consuming 110 amps of current so that extra 10 amps has to be drawn from the battery back again so you basically uh, having your inverter in between so you, you're trying to consume more energy than an average energy consumption because the temperature has impacted the motor's efficiency and that motor efficiency is directly impacted the you know uh, current consumption and then that is at your inverter so inverter need to draw a lot of current and then convert it uh, so you have again on the battery side also higher discharge rates so this is sort of a cumulative effect right so it's it's just a ripple at one place and then another place into another place so this is this is very challenging to be studied through how do I, you do a ripple like you know, studies at every phase but when you have a model which is totally synchronized and uh, it automatically sort of considers itself for the variations in the efficiency and things like that so and also on the other side as i said motor control is basically for power electronics and that will definitely get more hotter and that requires uh, a cooling system and that means it's an auxiliary unit uh, auxiliary unit is basically trying to you know consume a bit more energy for its cooling requirements so as in simplicity so it is it is a direct influence of temperature on the motor and at, at that same phase and also i would say at the over span of it so it is quite important and evident do you consider an, an influence of parameter at the temperature on the motor side and this could really impact a lot if if there is no proper studies done that you know how motor could possibly uh, go bonkers at various temperatures right it, it maybe it, it is great efficiency at let's say between the bandwidth of like 20 30 but if it goes 35 i think it, it's just I know 35 is a very small number because operating temperatures of motors are really, really high. I'm just giving a reference value. Uh, if the temperature of the atmosphere is about 40 degrees Celsius, then it, it is going to be impacted on the uh, working temperature of the motor. So you could do some of the studies to see how it's actually getting influenced. And there are a lot of other studies, but, but for us as a part an engineer, so that's what is required to estimate the energy consumption. So temperature uh, impact on HVAC systems. Maybe just a question out here, you know, if you guys have uh, worked in automotive or have an exposure, just guess what would be an average size of uh, Nissan's uh, hatchback unit uh, uh, in kilowatts. So I'm just waiting for your answers. Uh, one second, yeah. Yeah, so if you just uh, drop me a message, I'm just trying to expect that, you know, what would be the average size of Hatchback units uh, in terms of the work for, for Nissan Leaf. Or let's say if you know about a bus application, if you're working in a um, commercial vehicle segment. So, what's the average uh, HVAC unit size uh, in terms of uh, kilowatts? Any, any clues? Anyone is dropping your answers? Or if you have already messaged, I'm sorry, I might have missed those texts. Okay, so um, Praveen, Mayano, uh, Rajesh, that's great. Thank, thanks a lot for answering. Uh, Mayano, what, what is that segment for? Is it for a commercial vehicle or is it for a... Okay. <clears throat> right. So if you take about uh, 
Nissan Leaf at uh, peak of its uh, operations uh, about, I think, uh, motor, motor for the compressor. Because if you see, you need to understand a system a little bit differently uh, in here. Let me just go back. Yeah. So if you see the systems here, right? So these systems are basically a little different than our uh, ICs. Uh, so you have uh, a compressor, uh, but the compressor is driven by your uh, electric motor, right? So the electric motor would definitely need to be driven by uh, a source of battery. So that means it, it consumes as same as a traction motor. So now an average size, uh, I would not say average size, the size of Nissan Leaf's uh, powertrain components is about 4.7 kilowatt. I would say yeah, it varies from what date, what year of the model I'm talking about, but what year the model it is possibly today. It's about 4.7 kilowatt at peak of its operation. Maybe average if you're not doing it too much abusive. So let's say you, you, the day's temperature is 20 and you want to keep the cabin temperature to be 27, then it's just operating somewhere around uh, lower loads, like part loads of 30% or something like that, or 25% or something like that. So you would consume about, let's say 1.5 kilowatt, right? So if you take an example of uh, uh, Mahindra E2, right? So Mahindra E2's uh, size is about, uh, I think uh, it starts from, I think eight kilowatt. Uh, it goes up to about, I think, 12 kilowatt. So this is an average uh, pack size, I think, for mine the tool. Don't take me wrong if it is incorrect. So, and then now we are talking about <clears throat> HVAC and its uh, size, it's about uh, uh, an average, let's say, it's simplistically 4.7 kilowatt. And <clears throat> now if, if you're consuming average about, uh, let's say, two kilowatt per hour, right? So if you run your HVAC system for let's say about uh, four hours, this battery pack would go out. And if you're running it for six hours, this possibly battery pack would go out. So it means if you're commuting average about one hour in a day uh, with your AC on, you're consuming about like nearly two kilowatt. I mean, I would say that's an average number. It may be smaller for uh, uh, E2O because the vehicle size is too smaller and uh, but still there is a metabolic heat of four people because that is what it is designed for. And only the cabin size is smaller and maybe the, the components sizes are smaller in terms of the calculation purposes. So, but still you, you would average consume about nearly, if it is, let's say one, 1 1.5 kilowatt. So it's, it's still a lot of, you know, uh, I would say uh, consumption, right? So you have to study the influence and if you take uh, like something like an average uh, energy can, like temperature over a day, right? Let's say the temperature goes up on the afternoon and then it just comes down. Uh, let's say this is temperature and this is time across the day. And let's say this is somewhere about like 2 p.m. at afternoon. So if you're running somewhere here, obviously you're gonna consume more, right? Because the temperature of that atmosphere is really, really high. And let's say this is take about Chennai, maybe around 45 degrees Celsius. So, and averagely this is about, let's say 30 something, uh, right? So if you're operating anywhere in those regions, you're obviously going to consume more energy. So now your objective is basically, okay, how do you get this graph first? You get this graph by having a lot of uh, uh, market data studies. Um, by from weather demand data, and then apart from it, you also can uh, observe uh, temperature or because of average product development cycle at the design phase itself is about like one year or a half year. So you could take those considerations and study the the average energy consumption by HVAC system. So okay, let just go back. You could use an HVAC system for heating purposes, and you also could use your HVAC system for heating purposes. So cooling purposes and heating purposes, right? So the cooling is required when temperature is more, and the heating is required if temperature is lesser. So heating could also can happen by taking some energy, which is a waste heat from motor and maybe battery, but you know the system is more complex when you're trying to do that. If it is liquid cooling, it's a different way, but if it is air cooling, like, you know, you could just have very small chances of doing any of those things. So you have to have your heater, 
and you're not talking countries like India possibly, we are talking like US or Europe, where the temperatures would go like very, very low, uh, you still need to have electric heater. So that heater circuit has to be again driven by an electric uh, uh, system. So that again consumes energy. If it's a cooling, then through a compressor. So both of them are required at various uh, uh, weather conditions. So you've got to study all these systems into a place because uh, as I said, average uh, size of uh, uh, Nissan Leaf is around 4.7 kilowatt. And uh, maybe for, for segments like, uh, again, buses have multiple segments, right? Uh, you have like small force based and you have like buses at complete full length, multi axles and everything. I think it, it ranges anywhere between like about eight kilowatt up to somewhere uh, close around 18, uh, 16 kilowatt. And if you're running that bus, like if you're taking uh, uh, Vayu Vajra or something like that in Bangalore, and if you want to run an AC full blown, I have to keep it at retained at 25 degrees Celsius. And if that prospect temperature is around 35 that day, and you, you, you got them con, you know, consuming about uh, uh, at least of eight kilowatt, you know, per hour and eight kilowatt of batteries are really, really big to carry around. If you want to have your bus to drive around for, for a distance of, let's say, um, I would say like uh, five hours uh, in a day, and you could know how much big battery would be required for that, right? I mean, just exaggerating a little bit but i i would say even if it's a smaller number about like five kilowatt or six kilowatt and for that number of people like metabolic it is really high and uh, the conduction is really high because the body of the bus is too big and definitely there's going to be more energy consumption so you got to consider all these factors in place and uh, you will be able to study as i said you know there is a very specific numericals to go and uh, calculate each parameters of uh, energy consumption, but I'm not just trying to stress on that. As I said, uh, building an HVAC system model itself is like an, um, a one day uh, a lesson if you already have a very solid idea of modeling softwares. So I think there are some people who have taken up our courses on level three. This is all the part of the level three courses who are here too. Uh, I saw some names and kudos for them. So um, let's, I think, Coming back onto the topic, so I, I sort of want to summarize that, you know, it, it is basically consuming, HVAC system consumes a lot of energy. So how do you study? You're going to study at various different approaches, uh, at various different uh, uh, methods. There is something called preconditioning the cabin. There is something called non you know, without a precondition the cabin and stuff like that. So if you perform all these things at various different conditions, um, according to uh, OEM's requirement or according to government regulation requirements. Um, what I'm trying to brief out here is, okay, how do I even run the test? Okay, so how do I set up my test case to, to be going into the system? And let's say, okay, if the temperature is 25, okay, am I running the test at 25 starting from it? Or because if that most peak temperature is sometimes, let's say 35, sometimes the cabin temperature is, is not 35, actually it is more than 35 because sun soaking would have happened and there's a, a hot air which has been accumulated inside the car. So, you know, you should consider all of this and that is when it makes it more meaningful to study. Uh, so if it is a, a hot temperature, that's a different way. If it's a cold one, maybe you preheat the whole cabin and bring it to a specific temperature and then conduct your test at real time conditions. So as in the same way, this things becomes quite a complex at, at times when you have to run. But you could you could consider all of them, and that's what an and and very in depth pattern modeling is, where you could consider all of them uh, because the influence of these parameters are really high. If you take a very simple system like a headlight, right, and or at least like a horn, very less amount of current, right, depending upon obviously the light which light you're trying to use, or at least the music system, right, they're not consuming too much. If you're taking audio system, they're not consuming too much. But if you're considering something like HVAC, it, it's too big. I mean, it's, its impact is going to be really, really high. And uh, so you have to consider it well uh, if you want to, like, you know, sort of uh, 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 model it into a place and consider it. And then some of the auxiliary loads. Uh, so, as I said, auxiliary loads would be your battery cooling. So, if the battery is too hot, then you need to cool that battery. 
So you have to require cooling system for that. And again, this cooling system is going to be driven by your chiller and then from there to the compressor. So you need uh, energy even to run the motor to run the cooling system, right? So that is one part of it. If it is a hot conditions and the cold conditions, you need to heat the battery pack. And to heat it too, you need a heater circuit. And uh, 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 that's when, again, the heater requires uh, energy. Uh, so again, you have to take that energy from the battery. Um, so that consumes energy, like, you know, overall, uh, I would say, inclusion to energy consumption. As in similar, so you also require uh, motor cooling, which is another extensive thing and a complicated thing. So if you want to cool the motor, so it, it again requires uh, a, a whole lot of studies. And that, that is something required at uh, motor, you know, motor design engineering side. But for us, okay, possibly what would be the average energy consumption at various different temperatures, uh, depending upon the flow rate of the <clears throat> cooling, and then considering uh, its uh, uh, operations, those guys can give it to us uh, from the, the motor design team. And for, for us, and we can include them into the model and we could study, okay, this would be the energy and you know, how if variation in the day could actually impact. And if the temperature is predefined at X and Y and Z conditions, you know, what would be the impact of that temperature? And then the power electronic side of it, obviously, like if you take another side, like, I only talked about motor controller, but you have DC DC converter, you also have a charger. So all these components uh, required to be studied because if you have a fast charger, right? So if the fast charger could actually uh, make the battery to go too hot. And that, that time you again need cooling systems into a place. So that, that means it's, it's a lot of energy to be you know, consumed for even cooling the battery during the uh, fast charging. And now we are trying to achieve uh, uh, very higher numbers of fast charging and the fast charging means it's great and on the other side it's, it's very thermal challenges for engineers to design and develop a system uh, for us because during the charging it's one way if you consider an overall product uh, how the energy is going to be you know consumed but if you consider during the charging we don't worry much uh, because it, it I mean you do worry in terms of responsibility but in terms of uh, uh, what I say as uh, uh, a simulation level of part train, we can't do much because that is something on the chemistry side, maybe that is something on the what, you know, at a complete vehicle level, you want to keep the charger to be very quickly charging the vehicle, and that's what customers are demanding. So it's it just not in your hands. So what is in your hands is, okay, does, does the temperature charging, if you're charging at 4C, okay, what, what would be the possible higher requirements of energy con consumption? Maybe the battery is about uh, 100 kilowatt, and you're charging the battery in let's say four hours and it's about 25 kilowatt per hour. But actually it's not 25 kilowatt per hour because there's an again conversion losses in the, inside the battery and the conversion losses at your charger too. And all these things are happening. Then again, there's energy consumption for the cooling systems. So it's not 25, possibly it's 30. So it's 30 into four is about uh, 120. So you're, you're taking about other 20 kilowatt more uh, to charge your battery. Uh, at DC fast charging. Possibly if you do the slow charging, you would have only consumed possibly an, an five to eight kilowatt kilowatts more, but you consume more than what you're supposed to be uh, in, in fast charging. Uh, but yeah, at overall wake level, so demand always comes from your boss and, and that comes from your top management. So you have to listen to that and you could only give an analysis that, okay, hey, this is how it's impacting and uh, fast charging could actually cause more challenges uh, in terms of uh, if you consider average energy consumption at well-to-wheel -well analysis, your vehicle could be doing more energy consumption at fast charging. So anyhow, that's just out of the topic. And yeah, so that's pretty much what I want to kind of drive in. Uh, I clocked in, I think, 40 minutes for this explanation. I believe it was insightful for all of you. Uh, I mean, if concluding point is it's complex, you know, it's very complex and that's what uh, is a challenge and it's it's depending upon each system to system uh, if you are like guy from Aether so you, you know your part range and if you're a guy from maybe Bajaj there is a different component sizing and you know if, if you are from a, a, a bus segment if you're from a, a four-wheeler segment again let's say if you take uh, my uh, Tata Motors they have like multiple product lines into a place so each product 
segment required to be validated at different requirements because the part and component sizing is different at each levels, right? So that's that's sort of summary that you know it's a very complex thing and and you need to study that complex thing by considering every parameter. And if you don't do it, then you're gonna possibly have your part frame being messed up uh, at at the road, right? So cool. So takeaway out of this is it's very important uh, to study and do include those studies on your part frame simulations if you're guys from industry. Uh, if you're from academics, so it's a, it's a big open space. Um, uh, at, it means that you know it's going to be a good opportunity for for students to study or, or faculties to do some research activities and know how systems are behaving. You could have cell cycling units. You could have cell temperature units. I would say atmospheric temperature conditioning chambers. You could study cells. Motor testing is complex. I would not suggest you if you're at academics, but if you're at industry, so there is no option for you, you have to do that. So do study the systems, and by that way, it's, it's, it just fulfills everything altogether. Great, so now you know that this is very important, and you know it's, it is impacting a lot, so you, you have to study it. So we have some courses, which makes it up above on top of the best in, in the whole place. Uh, in terms of the content, in terms of quality, in terms of the way we teach. So you could start at level one, it's free. And as I just delivered, there are a lot of other uh, videos available on the YouTube, so you could, you could check them out. And, and at level two, we were trying to talk about a powertrain as an unit at a simplicity, but without a lot of external, uh, a lot of parameters. But at level three, so I'm tr we're trying to go through each of these topics and address them. I mean, I just told you a few of the topics and like in similar, we have different considerations to be done and we do implement all of them and we teach that at level three so i mean that's up above any of the industry requirements and we teach the same content to a lot of our uh, you know our, uh, industry customers to add pattern courses and decibels and last two months has been fantastically great because we have addressed more industry partners than actually addressing uh, academic partners into our place because they see a lot of value in, in the courses at decibels so if you're looking for it, you could definitely plan because the thing is, uh, and in the studies are there uh, for many years in other countries, but, but right now in India, if you take a whole academic situations or expertise situations, uh, expertise numbers, they're very small. So if you kind of pick up these skills and they have helped them, people have got interviews, people have cracked the interviews, it's just because they have done those projects at decibels. Um, so I have all the stories and that's available on our website. I could surely check it out and I don't want to sort of just do a marketing in here, but, but just an, and trust factor I could put it in. So yeah, blah, blah, blah. So this is pretty much in here, what all we do. And if you're interested, you could write me in there, uh, contact at threadecibelslab.com. Uh, so for any of your queries, we could address. Um, so if it's a consulting, that's another part into a place. If you want to learn, you could definitely drop in these things into this email ID. So I should be able to help you out. And, and how we can take things out from here. Fantastic, I think if, if you know, your participation and your time, uh, I believe it served the purpose uh, uh, in terms of utilizing it best to know the subject as its complexity and why EV is not just another fact to bring in few components and assemble and just sell it to the market and then you could have a very bad product and it, it just brings down your reputation. So it, it needs to be engineered in a very, very proper way and, and, and in a very, very you know, rigorous way uh, with, with the right testing and the you know, right expertise. And that's what is missing across uh, a sector. So uh, gear up and people need you. Uh, people need better engineers, companies need better engineers. So we're there to help you if you, if you need anything down the line on power train simulations. Great, uh, that's pretty much from my side what I would like to talk uh, in terms of the whole delivery. Just let us know. Uh, if you have any questions right here, I have here for other 50 minutes. I would take those questions and try to answer with my best knowledge. Um, I'm sharing the slides, you know, honestly, my slides are uh, in terms of images. So there is nothing much you could, you could refer them if you see my presentations anywhere across because I just use them to give a picturization and rest is all on my discussions. So. I'm not sure sharing this presentation would make any use. Um, okay. Uh, Suryatej, how, 
how to choose a control, uh, choose strategy, air or liquid cooling at high temperature for batteries and roll of HVAC in this situation. Okay, so HVAC is a very different unit and uh, your cooling of the batteries is a very different unit. So the cooling of the batteries, you could know what temperatures, uh, like what what is that dissipation rate you're trying to achieve. Uh, so, you know, if it is very, very high and you have to go for liquid cooling, it, it depends, you know, you have a standard uh, maybe uh, uh, units available uh, in terms of the cooling. You check if they really you know, suffice the purposes. If they do not, and if your temperatures, if your dissipation requirements are really, really big, there is only way it's liquid, liquid cooling. So if your dissipation rates are very less, again, that depends upon your component sizing. It depends upon your driver, what segment of the vehicle. Maybe if you're developing a sports segmented vehicles, so you, you don't have any option, basically. So except the, the liquid cooling systems. So yeah, if it is another non-performance vehicle, so you have options to evaluate. It, it totally depends, you know. Uh, evaluate what is its dissipation requirements, uh, then you could definitely plan your uh, uh, component selection, either cooling for air or using liquid. How much does the discharge rate vary from these lithium ion batteries? Okay, that's sort of very wide question. So maybe if you can be a bit, bit, bit more pointing to topic, I could, I could try to answer that. How much does the discharge rate vary from these lithium ion battery packs? Okay. I, I didn't get the context of the question, Praveen, so you can just redraft that. Could you state some reasons for extreme heating of motor controller and BLDC motors in heavy? It's no, basically you know, at a very, uh, I would not say at a research level because I'm an application engineer and what we do is on the application side of it. Uh, so what is possibly is that, you know, you may have a batch sizing of the components, okay? So, and you're trying to operate always above your nominal conditions, that would be the requirement. Or maybe you design the product for a specific segment and your customer is abusing that segment of the vehicle. Maybe he's trying to carry another extra load on that. So you thought that, you know, it's gonna be a, passenger vehicle, but it's, it's, it's trying to be sort of in a goods sort of a thing. So you always have a lot of conditions on that. So those are a few things. And then you have obviously certain you know, conditions of atmosphere influencing that. And if you have any of these things, then it, that's the way I see uh, in terms of your uh, uh, you know, overeating of the components. But if you ask me maybe at the engineering side of uh, power electronics or engineering side of motor design, there could be many other reasons for that. Uh, right, yeah, we could, I, I tried the record button, so I think it should be recording right now. So I should be able to put that in the YouTube. And uh, yeah, if you, are, if you are in Decibels Lab platform, I could just send you, uh, you know, uh, uh, email once I upload these videos uh, to everyone. And those videos are also available in uh, this place. Uh, I'm just trying to be sure if I can, yeah. So if you hit uh, lms.decibelslab.com, okay, so we have a community. That's one thing where you can get all your free courses, okay? And then you go to webinars, you just pop in your details here. Um, let's say in terms uh, you enroll and then you can get emails when we you know, upload these videos. Okay, so um, if you want to use a battery for drones and normally LiPo provided from 20C, uh, if it was a lithium ion battery, can you achieve the same? I, I really doubt that if we could do, but there are chemistries, uh, you, could, you could use it for specific applications. But yeah, as it said, you know, anything on that very specific answer is always tough because it needs to be analyzed and understood. Maybe which chemistry of the lithium it is, and you know whether it is tested for that, whether it is required for those applications. Uh, yeah, you could, we could think on that and then decide probably. Okay, so that would be good input to Rajesh. Great. So, um, any other questions? Uh, if 
if you have any questions, that's please over to you to drop those questions. If you have no questions on that, um, I think that uh, we're pretty much summarizing for today. Uh, if you're interested, these programs are starting up from uh, you know next November, number two. So if you're looking for it, you could just start them over. So for students, we call it as internships because it helped them in starting their career. For professionals, we call them as certification programs. So anything that suits to you, so you could always take them up and, and begin your journey into it. Just share us a feedback. Um, uh, you know, I would say, how was this webinar uh, before you leave? And that gives me sort of base that, you know, whether it is really useful, informative, should I add more and should I try to talk a bit lesser? Uh, so I could do that. So if you share your feedbacks, that is going to be fantastic. Uh, so please, my small request, uh, if you could just share it. I mean, that would be amazing before you leave. Okay, so a small request from me uh, for all the efforts we have put to make these presentations. So you could share your feedbacks and on honest ones, you know, really honest ones. Uh, so we would improvise ourselves on that line. Uh, how do you suggest a level modeling of thermal management system of EV powertrain? So we don't specifically model the thermal systems in an EV. If you want to design, let's say, uh, a cooling system, okay? If you want to design, let's say, uh, uh, studies of, of between air cooling and liquid cooling. So what we're trying to do is right now at a powertrain simulations, we're trying to have an understanding of influence of parameters on the um, uh, energy consumption. That's what we study at decibels. Uh, so, to, yeah, I mean, definitely there are a lot of students who are pursuing the programs as an internships. You could surely look forward to be the part of those programs too. And most of the people who have completed our level three are, are either getting placed or most of them getting absorbed at decibels. So you could surely look forward for that. Yeah, so if, if you're sharing your feedback, it's, it's great and we're just waiting for you if there is no much questions. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much from my side overall. If you have any questions, I'm here. If not, so thank you very much uh, for participating in the whole uh, session and thank you very much for being all there. Uh, I, it, it feels really great that we could share something and bring that awareness that why it is so complex and why you need to study the systems uh, for understanding. Um, I believe that brought an, an idea to take things ahead uh, to plan. Uh, if you want to be in the areas of EV or the elderly uh, people in the EV sector to be working more on those stressful points. So uh, again, kudos to everybody who have been here. Uh, thanks a lot. And it's uh, fantastic uh, to have you here today uh, with us and all the best for your future endeavors. Um, if anything, they're on EV, so you could always try for decibels. We're there to help you. Uh, so until then, for the next webinar, it's going to be possibly Wednesday. So we call it as a webinar Wednesday. So uh, we would be able to come back to those webinars on every Wednesday. Wednesdays. All right. So uh, there is no extra feedback as such. Uh, so you could drop in the feedbacks right here in the chat box.